Hey everyone, this is Alex, and welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge Podcast. People say low information voters, and I'm starting to kind of think that that's wrong. I don't know that it's necessarily like a low information problem. People are just looking for the easy way to understand how to vote. America is built on the idea of trying to make things better and easier for people. Making the political process hard doesn't benefit anyone. For Republicans in Oregon, I think we ought to argue for the most competitive elections available to give the most choices. It's not Republican gerrymandered maps. It's maps that allow us to actually get into a majority of voters who want us there and put us in the extreme super minority if they don't. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode. Today, really excited to bring you Republican operative Reagan Cano. And if you are somewhat involved in Oregon politics, either on the Republican side of the aisle or the Democratic side of the aisle, you probably know who Reagan is because uh, he served in a number of high-level positions in the Oregon GOP. He served as the political director for Oregon Right to Life. He also owns his own consulting company and has uh, worked for a number of clients, both on the federal and on the state level with that. His dad is none other than State Senator Tim Canope, who we will also hope to have on this podcast at some point. And uh, we're really excited to have Reagan because Reagan had some excellent insight, both on the recent battles in the legislature over redistricting, and then also just kind of on the future of uh, politics in general, especially on the GOP side of thing. And Reagan is definitely, I would say, uh, a star up and coming in the party. I would for sure assume for him to run for office at some point, either on the state or on the local level. So make sure to watch out for that. And uh, he has been uh, definitely more of a maverick, I would say, too, on the GOP side of things. He's been willing to criticize Trump. He's been willing to criticize other Republicans. Uh, and he also serves as the editor of the Oregon Catalyst, which is one of the most popular uh, I think it actually is the most popular conservative uh, blog and, and news news media company in the state. So lots of interesting things discussed in this episode, again, just from the state of the party and also Reagan's personal background. So we'll just go ahead uh, and dive right in and uh, just please make sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And we look forward to seeing you in the episode. All right, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode. We're very excited because uh, Reagan is a huge fan of the show. He's listened to every episode, I think, and he always gives us good feedback. So, Reagan, thank you for joining. And how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I have a little bit. I, you can't maybe can't hear, but I have a tiny bit of a, a cold that I'm getting over. So, okay. I thought you were going to say that your your baby was in the background, and obviously, as conservative, we're very pro natalists, so we love babies. You know, so. very pro family. Uh, <laughs> it's a very pro family flex I have here. What? How many? How many kids do you have? I have two kids, Oliver, who is currently napping. He's two. And then my daughter, Maggie, is here on the floor. And she decided she didn't want to nap at the same time as her brother. And she is almost six months. Very cool. Very cool. There we go. So, Reagan, your dad is a state senator. You're obviously very involved in politics. Uh, give us the, the quick overview of the Canope family's history in Oregon GOP politics. Yeah, so I think most of it is my, my dad. But we do have kind of one fun little story. Eddie O'Canope, who is my great grandfather, was actually the mayor of, of Pendleton. And uh, he got to meet Ronald Reagan, gave him a key to the city. Um, and so we, we really uh, appreciate that memory. But yeah, mostly through uh, my dad. So he kind of started as a, as a low tax activist in the, in the 80s and then ran for state legislature. He actually lost his first late race in a primary by like 100 ish votes. Um, against who? And he, an incumbent? What's that? Against an incumbent? Yeah, it was, it was Dennis Luke, a Republican oh. from Central Oregon. He was in mm. House Measure 54, and that was like three redistricting ago when Ben was a, like a quarter, maybe a third the size it is now. But one of the things that he said was that that experience basically taught him that door knocking wins elections because he basically counted the number of doors he knocked and that equivalent, it was equivalent to the number of votes he got. And wow. so next hmm. time he's, you know, and then I think the next cycle, uh, it was a couple of cycles after he ran and won his first term in the Oregon House. And that was in the days when they had term limits. And so you got into leadership after your first term. And so he became the majority leader. So he was elected in 01. And so he's the 2000 election, I think. Or no, he was elected in 99. And then his, uh, so he was 98 that he ran and, and won in the seat it was open and then he, in 2000 uh was his second election and that is after that election he got into leadership i think 
and then he was the majority leader uh, in his third uh, and final term. What do you What do you remember from that time? Like, were you with him in the office? Like, were you did you have a consciousness of what was going on, or Dad was just in Salem all the time? No, yeah, I didn't. I, and it's funny the story that he tells was basically like me and my siblings in tears calling him on the phone saying dad when are you going to be home and like that's when he decided to to leave the legislature um and and so his last session was 2003 his last election was 2002 the thing that i remember the most honestly from the legislature was getting noogies from ben westland uh, which was they were the hardest noogies you've ever gotten and then we visited his house in central (laughs) oregon a couple of times they hurt so bad but um it's still like the number one thing that's burned into my brain but it was a lot of fun. Everyone was really nice. You know, that was, uh, and I think that's one of the things when I got back to the Capitol as a staffer in his first year in the Senate in 2013. So he'd won the 2012 election, primaried Chris Telfer, uh, and then, and then won the general election. And so I came back in 2013 and basically everyone in the building, like you look, you compare the lobby books from when he was in the building the first time, the second time, it's like nothing changed. <laughs> Same people. <laughs> there were so many lobbyists that were just like, I remember you when you were a little kid. And I was literally like, it's so nice to meet you, but this is really the first time I can actually remember <laughs> you as a person. But everyone was really nice and kind. And that's, I mean, that was one of my favorite things about working in the legislature is it seemed like that there was a culture of people who did politics, but the politics in the legislature was their job. And they didn't take it home with them to the extent that they were friends with lobbyists from organizations that were against each other on bills and and legislators that were against each other on issues. Um, I think it'd be still be there if you go there. Uh, but obviously, there's just there's a lot more political heat, and I think that there's also just a lot more that we've exposed in terms of the stuff that was going on that wasn't um, going well for a lot of people. And I think it was important that that happens. I think that rules twenty seven still sucks, but I think everybody thinks it sucks. And they're just trying to work through how you can have accountability in an environment that's still partisan and all of the accountability pieces are still going to have partisan results and outcomes, even if you don't want them to. That's a really hard problem to solve. What and is, can you explain, no matter who's in the minority, they're going to hate it. Can you explain Rule 27? So Rule 27, and this came in after I left the legislature because my last year working in the legislature was 2016 short session, if I remember right. I left to go run Colm Willis' congressional campaign against Kurt Trader. Rule 27 is a legislative rule that was implemented. Um, I can't, I think it's just in the rule book. I don't know if it has statutory backing or not, but basically it just says that if you, if there, it, here's all the steps that you have to take and all the the mitigation and hearings that will result from a, a harassment action if you make someone feel uncomfortable in the workplace. It's not always sexual, but most of the time it, it's sexual harassment. Um, and so it's been used a couple of different times in pretty high profile situations. Diego Hernandez is one, Nierman is another one. I'm trying to think, I think, um, can't remember if there's anyone else who's been what, 27. So there's what, been other hearings. What would you describe as the critique of rule 27? I think part of the issue is, is it tries to encompass a lot of different stuff. And it just says, this is what we do with harassment. And harassment takes a lot of different forms. And if you don't have enough, like they discovered, I think that the process doesn't go fast enough. And in certain situations, people, it's just like we're humans. And so we kind of stop caring about things that are old. And so you really want to deal with those quickly in order to give justice actually to both sides. I think the other part of it is, is that there's concern that it's too open to rule by the majority, even though you have a conduct committee that's split, the speaker can still do what she wants in a lot of situations. Um, And I think that there are concern that there isn't quite enough shielding between the equity office, which handles the harassment, and then the leadership and the politicals that run the building, whether they're outside lobbyists that are interfering in the process, legislators that aren't involved in the process that are interfering or the speaker interfering. And so it's it's hard stuff to prove because typically it's just not documented and that's just the way it works. But I think that the more we can find ways to move it outside the political process and shield it from it, you'll get slightly better results. But the outcomes are still going to feel political to everybody anyway. Hmm. That's interesting. And, I, you know, we... We all, we want to have your your father on at some point, but I, I just was thinking like I'm pretty sure Senator Knope was like one of the most outspoken Republicans standing with 
Sarah Gelser, Senator Sarah Gelser, who's been on the pod before, um, when the allegations against Senator Cruz, so it would like was Rule Twenty Seven. Rule Twenty Seven was in effect then. No, it was after. Oh, Cruz created Rule Twenty Seven. Essentially, okay. I think the Cruz situation was the first major sexual harassment scandal to occur in the legislature. And I don't think it was the immediate session. I think it took actually two sessions to create the Rule 27. Uh, and it mostly exists in a similar form now. I think they amended it uh, a session after they created it. But yeah, Cruz was the creator of that. And he was, I think, maybe the only Republican that was in the Senate caucus to speak up, which was really difficult, I'm sure, because sitting in the room with caucus members and trying to decide what's going to be the, the outcome of this and and I don't know that it was necessarily looked favorably on by everybody, but I think that he still felt like it was the right thing to do. I actually wrote an op-ed saying that Jeff Cruz needed to resign in Oregon Catalyst hmm. a couple of weeks after he did. Um, I was just talking to people and trying to understand what was going on. And and it really just seemed like there was partisanship that was existing in the process for no good reason. And I think on that the that's- On the Republican side? Uh, on the Republican side, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I also think that if Cruz had apologized, he would still be in the Senate which is kind of shocking, but I think it's absolutely true. Well, there's other stuff with the Cruz situation too. Like one of the things I remember thinking was bizarre and actually kind of funny was like Senate President Courtney removed the door to his office because he's also like smoking cigarettes constantly in his office. Yeah, so I had an office, Ken Kenobe's office, my dad's office, the first two sessions, the whole time I worked in his office was across the hall on Senate third floor from Cruz and Almost every day you could smell him smoking. He usually tried to either do it early in the morning or wait until late in the day. But yeah, you could always, you could smell it. And it was bad. It had been bad for years. Interesting. Uh, so Reagan, we had some recent news come out and I will give the very top line quick summary of it. And then we want all of the juicy details since we know that you've been following this so closely. So okay. uh, Democrats led by Speaker Kotek basically rescinded their offer to give Republicans an even say in redistricting. They were easily able to pass through their maps. I believe Oregon was the first in the country actually to finalize their maps, I'm not mistaken. Lots of details inside of there. What happened? What's the juicy parts of the process? Uh, how did this actually end up coming to the state? The state. All right, so I, and it's important to know, I was not in, on the inside in the process. I talked to people who worked on it. I'm not going to share names because I, I think, uh, that wouldn't really um, keep the confidence that they had in me, but I'll try to share kind of the, the generics of it. You have two extenuating circumstances, one on the Republican side and one on the Democratic side that dictated the decisions that were made. So these are the two most important things. So I firmly believe that either in words or implied, Democrats in DC basically said that Oregon Democrats should not produce a map that contained more than one Republican leaning seat. So you have CD2 under the old map, you had one Republican leaning district, two swing districts, uh, kind of, but Republicans have struggled to put up good candidates against Schrader and DeFazio in the fifth and the fourth. And then mm -hmm. one and three are just absolutely unreachable. And so the directive basically was, don't you dare send us a second Republican from Oregon. Why do you um, think, we can't handle it. Why do you think it came from national versus just like, that's what the Democrats in Oregon thought was best? Well, so I, I think that because of the quotes that Schrader and DeFazio gave publicly blasting Kotech for splitting committee assignments. I think that that was basically the shot across the bow. You know, I don't know that there was a call from Pelosi's office. There probably a read between the, you think it was, read, I think read it was like lines. you read between the lines and your career is over if you do this. So, hmm. and, wow. and I don't blame them also because Republicans are, are drawing Republican, heavily Republican favored maps all over the country because we won a ton of legislatures in 2010 and mm -hmm. we haven't given up most of them. So um, Democrats have made some gains, but they haven't done a, a great job of, of bringing back legislative power. They lost a huge, over a thousand legislative seats uh, under the Obama midterm in 2010. I think they've only picked up a couple hundred since. So, well, so that other, was the first the, one. The other context here that I think even you will probably concede, like there's also crazy Republican gerrymandering happening in a lot of states across the country, Texas just came out with a map with these like 
they make the Oregon districts look totally rational and e- obvious. Whoa, they get, like, the, 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 those are very fairly to- drawn I maps. Say, I wouldn't say totally uh, rational and obvious. You have you have basically a pizza drawn out of Portland when you could easily keep, hold it into two two districts. But I do understand your point. And what's interesting about Texas gerrymandering too is it's not like they just ran a computer and said what's the optimum Democratic map. They took into account who are the current incumbents, who they want to win races, and basically mm-hmm. what they did is they took all the Republicans in safe seats and they in in swing seats, excuse me. So like Dan Crenshaw is pretty well known, yeah. So Dan Crenshaw is in a Trump plus one district. Now he did better than that; he overperformed Trump, but they gave him a Trump plus eighteen district in the new map. Isn't that illegal? Like to, to I mean, be I, like, like I don't to, know what the laws are in Texas. Okay, so the Oregon provision that says you can't take into account where someone lives or benefiting a, a political party or person is a state law, not a not a federal requirement. Yeah, fe- there's no federal law on gerrymandering. I know Democrats want one, but it's not going to happen. Well, not even just gerrymandering, but advantaging an individual or... Uh, yeah. Whatever. Well, and I don't know that Oregon state law actually says you can't advantage an individual. I think it just says you can't partisan gerrymandering. I'd have to go back and look at the statute Although, to know for sure. Fair, fair. So the second extraneous circumstance is that Republicans held the Secretary of State's office until 2020 because Dennis Richardson passed away, because uh, we weren't able to field as strong of a candidate as he was. We lost the Secretary of State's office in Shamia Fagan, and Republicans widely believed, um, not every Republican, but most Republicans believed that um, that Shamia Fagan would draw extremely partisan maps, that Republicans would would be locked out of not only the majority but this out of the locked into the super minority for the entire next 10 years based mm-hmm. on the kinds of maps that she would draw and the legislative maps and it took a long time but the ultimately adopted legislative maps are not that bad for republicans if you look at all the like partisan scoring tools most of them rate the legislative maps as basically neutral they rate the congressional maps as fairly partisan, but the so, legislative. So maps Reagan, are though, how neutral. how did we get to that point where, and, and I've heard the same thing, right? Is that I mean, things could have definitely been better on the legislative side, but I think they could have been, and and now we have a baby for the first time on the podcast. This <laughs> the is, listeners yeah, can't see, but Reagan just picked up his uh, his baby daughter Maggie. No, this is why you have to watch on old. YouTube so you can see this adorable baby. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Go to the YouTube for sure. She is very cute. The the fourth generation of of uh, of Canope political conservative stars is is rising here live on the Oregon <laughs> Bridge, uh, but Reagan. So why though, in your opinion, are right? I, I mean, the legislative maps clearly favor Democrats, but I think that they could have been significantly worse than what actually came out. That's why true. why were the congressional maps so much worse compared to the legislative ones? Right? Like, why didn't they both just suck? At least from from what Republicans would say. I think that what happened was, is in order to keep Republicans in play and in, in the Capitol instead of, because I don't think that Democrats completely all benefit from Fagan. Sure, Fagan draws maps that benefit Democrats overall, but individual Democrats in the legislature don't necessarily benefit from how she draws the maps. So they, it was easier for Republicans to stay in the building, try to keep themselves in the game on the legislative side try to break out of the super uh, minority and and just deal with the federal maps. Because you also have to remember that basically the choice for the legislators was don't show up in the House, kill the maps, and potentially get better mm. congressional maps from the judiciary. And I'll talk about that in a second. But you're basically screwing everybody else you know, you're screwing yourself and basically saying, look, we're going to be at, you know, 18 in the House and nine in the Senate or something crazy like that. I mean, there's (laughs) scenarios where you can draw maps like that. And that's really, really bad. And that's not just bad for the members of that caucus. That's bad for everything that you can do to limit and and stop or or uh, water down bad legislation that's going to affect the people that you represent. So ultimately, I think that they just decided the state benefits more with legislative maps that that aren't fully gerrymandered um and and, you know i think that there's ways you can draw maps that benefit republicans more that meet all of the uh, all of the standards that you have for redistricting um but that and i think that there's more that democrats could have done to keep communities of interest together like you have democrats that are basically locked into urban areas and republicans that benefit from suburban and rural areas and if you draw maps that are compact democrats get absolutely screwed but there is something to be said for compactness as a standard, but it's not a legal standard. So I don't know if that made sense. That does make sense. So the, the issue with the judiciary 
is because we've never seen them draw a wholesale map before. They've never done it. Every time, so we've only completed redistricting now, this is the second time uh, consecutively. Every time before that, all they've ever done is adjust the Secretary of State or legislative map. They've never taken on a wholesale redraw. And so even though you have a new law that was passed in 2013, I think that said that the congressional map goes to a five judge panel, one judge from each congressional district, we didn't know what kind of map they were going to draw. And that was the biggest issue is it's like, if we knew that they were just going to start from scratch, we would, and maybe they would have, but maybe they also would have drawn a map that looks very similar to the Democratic map. So sure. there's no mm-hmm. use to toss away five to you know, five to 10 legislative seats in order to gain maybe one congressional seat. So I have a question for you, just a sort of general broad question. Um, well, two, so starting broadly, do you, obviously you're a, a political consultant, so you engage mm-hmm. in political campaigns. Um, do you, do you see political polarization and partisan partisanship as a significant problem and rising problem in contemporary politics? Um, it, it's hard. It depends on what you mean by polarization, I guess. If you mean, if you mean people just voting for the party that they like the best, I think that part of the problem is, is like, we actually have a, people say low information voters, and I'm starting to kind of think that that's wrong. We have so much political information available to people now that it's almost like they're information overload voters. And so what they're actually looking for is a cheat code uh, to help them understand who to vote for. Because it's a lot of work, I guess this is what they mean by low information, it's a lot of work to dive into each individual candidate and their individual beliefs and find someone that matches you. It's a lot easier to just say, this has, they have the endorsement of this organization, that's the one issue I care about, or they are part of this party, which, you know, maintains 75% of the issues I care about. So, like, I don't know that it's necessarily, like, a low information problem. People are just looking for the easy way to understand how to vote. And, like, I don't really blame them for that, because, like, that's basically, America is built on the idea of trying to make things better and easier for people. And so, like, making the political process hard doesn't benefit anyone really. So the reason why I ask that is because I'm partially, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to our episode with Catherine Gale yet, um, but I think what she would say here, aside from her her like critique of how we should change elections, she would also probably say, and there's a lot of people who do say this, having competitive congressional elections like CD5, the new CD5 and new CD6 that are like could, depending on the year, easily be winnable by either side, depending on candidates, resources, et cetera, that that actually is probably better for democracy because those people have a greater incentive to collaborate with the other side, actually solve problems, rather than what Catherine says is there's an incentive for people in safe seats to not solve problems and keep problems um, churning so that every year you can go back to your voters and say, I have to go fight on this issue. Um, do you buy that argument at all? Or how, like, there's a- I don't think that anyone in the legislature, like no one sits there and says, wow, homelessness is a pig problem, but I won't, or, or you can think about like, you can think about one of the more partisan issues, like high taxes. That's such a big problem. I'm not going to solve high taxes because my voters won't vote for me if I solve that, because there is no solving high taxes. Like people are always going to think that they're taxed too much, I think. So it's like you can cut taxes and I think you receive a benefit from that, but like you haven't solved the issue of high taxes. And the same thing with like on the left, I think one of the biggest issues I find that's interesting is like gun violence. And Democrats are like, well, if we just ban guns, that'll be awesome. And it's like, well, okay, you've mandated masks and you've gotten, sure, some people, but there's like an element of people that like aren't going to comply with the order. And so now you're faced with the decision of whether you're going to engage law enforcement in this. And that's like a step where a lot of people are not going to be like, if you ask them if they, if, if you're a Democrat running for office and you ask them if you think you should limit firearm or magazine uh, sales or, or whatever it is, they'll say, yeah, absolutely. And then you ask them, do you think that law enforcement should be engaged in this? And that you probably won't get like a wholesale, like straight up. Yes. You'll probably get something like, yeah, we need to build systems that keep everybody safe. Like, so I don't think that anyone sits there necessarily and says we need this issue for the election. What I think happens is you just have opposing views on those issues. And some on the partisan issues where it's like Democrats don't want to solve low taxes, like that's not an issue for them. And so you have you have obviously a large portion of the of your elected officials that are going against the low tax position, right? Same thing with Republicans, where it's like we don't think that gun violence is a big enough problem to solve by limiting sales of guns or magazines to law-abiding citizens. Therefore, we're just going to pose you an issue. On the nonpartisan issues, usually has something more to do with like um, not in my backyard 
or or something else like that, right? So there's just always opposing views on the issues. I don't think that most people sit in elected office and say, I'm not gonna solve problems because then I can't get reelected. Because you have the opposite problem where if you don't solve enough problems, people will not elect you. It, f fair, and I think she's talking more about the congressional level where we are very accustomed to seeing problems not solved mm -hmm. um, and that there is a sense of coming back to your district and saying, I need to fight Donald Trump or I need to fight Barack Obama's yeah. liberal agenda or whatever. Um, so the way I gain that out though, I think, I do think that for, for Republicans in Oregon, I think we ought to argue for the most competitive elections available to give the most choices. And I think that's the best argument. It's not Republican gerrymandered maps. It's maps that allow us to actually get into a majority of voters who want us there and put us in the extreme super minority if they don't. And I think that a lot of Republicans in the building would have voted for those maps if they existed. But obviously Democrats, you don't necessarily want to put that in play. Right. And I understand why. And Republicans aren't putting that in play in other states. So I get it. But I think the biggest problem you have is, so let's just say every state says, okay, we're going to maximize the number of competitive uh, elections in our mm -hmm. congressional districts. What you're going to have is much wider swings in your elections. You're going to have Republicans mm -hmm. with 400 seats in the Congress and Democrats with 400 seats in the Congress. I think that your problem then is you don't have enough dissenting opinion necessarily to, to slow down or stop anything that's really extreme and you'll just get much more extreme policy. In the current, in, under the current rules and the current circumstances, you're gonna elect a lot of hardcore right or left wingers, right? Because those are the people who are gonna win your primary. So if you just flip the switch and say, we need more competitive elections, I think you'll get really extreme policy. Well, what you have to figure out how to do, and I don't know that there's necessarily an answer for this yet, is figure out how you can get back to a, a position where people are willing to to make deals and say, look, I'm going to give up on this issue and and uh, a little bit on this issue to get something I want on this issue, right? And so you'll just you'll make those compromises. Mm. But I don't know how to do that. Like that's a really hard problem to solve. We were expecting a very well thought out answer of how to solve that. So this is, this is a little disappointing, Reagan. <laughs> it was neither an answer nor well thought out. This is all just off the top of my head. No, I actually thought that was that was interesting. Um, and then I expected you to come out with an endorsement for Kurt Schrader at the end of it, but you didn't You didn't go there, so. <laughs> no, mostly because I don't think that Kurt is doing a very good job of being moderate at the current circumstance. Like he's saying that a second impeachment of Trump is basically a lynching, which is just like, I'd never advise anyone to say that. There's two things you don't do. That was wild. You don't compare, you don't compare stuff to lynching and you don't compare stuff to, to Nazi Germany, full stop. I don't care what it is, it's always different. And you know, say socialism, say communism, you know, if that's your perspective, that's fine. But like, yeah, Maggie, Maggie agrees. Maggie agrees. Maggie I'm, agrees. With <laughs> I'm with you, honey. So yeah, I mean, it's just, and so I thought that was dumb. And then he voted against checks for Americans, which is just like, why would you do that? Well, but and he, have you been following? I don't know, maybe it's about the have, deficit. I don't, I actually don't have it. I, I think that it was about, I think his, his argument at the time was like, we can't keep spending money, um, which I obviously disagree with for several reasons. Um, yep. But the, the the prescription drug thing is what is like wild to me. I don't know if you saw that. Um, so I don't fully, I don't, I don't even, I don't even pretend to fully understand that issue, but like, I understand where most of the partisan battle lines have been drawn and he seems to be on the other side of most Democrats. Yeah. Well, so this is actually an interesting one. And I, I mean, we can, this wasn't in our agenda, but I think it would be interesting to go here because I think Alex, Alex represents a more populist GOP than the GOP that your dad was involved in, you know, in the late 90s, right? Like, uh, like, and Alex, I haven't asked you about the prescription drug thing and whether or not you think like the government should be able to negotiate with drug companies to lower prices. Um, but that strikes me as something that might be, you might actually say, well, yeah, the big corporations that are making all this money off of poor people is a bad thing. Um, Titus, do I, ha do you have a thought on that? Do you know where you come down on it? Not specifically on the Medicare piece, but, uh, one thing that I thought was quite funny is that Trump had actually proposed, I forgot, I, I don't know that much about healthcare policy and I, I don't pretend to, but he actually proposed that, uh, something about like the, uh, the government and, or it was like the prescription benefit managers, like reforming that process basically. And like big pharma came out heavily against this during the election, even though he wanted to move forward with it. A lot of Republicans did uh, also come opposed to it too. And like the pharma PAC spent tens of millions of dollars to basically push forward for Biden. Uh, 
which now, of course, Biden is in office and now they're proposing this like even more dramatic <laughs> prescription drug reform. And if actually, if I'm not mistaken, too, Ron DeSantis in Florida actually passed something similar, which would like allow drug companies to buy cheaper drugs like from drug imports. So uh, I think that a lot of the sort of older GOP people are maybe a little bit stuck on the issue, but that like you have seen some different varieties of the GOP come forward with some various reforms that I think even 10 or 15 years ago, you wouldn't have seen. Wouldn't have so that's, so. that's a, it's a good case study. And my question isn't about healthcare or prescription drugs as much as it is like, where do you fall on, you know, the, like on the GOP spectrum? I think the GOP, it's pretty easy to identify the factions of, P at least at the national level. It's harder in Oregon, I actually think. You might have a better sense of where people fit, but um, at the national level, there's pretty clear factions aligned to like social conservatism, Trumpism, um, you know, foreign policy conservatives, et cetera. And there's a mix for each individual person, but um, where do you fall? How do you identify your own conservatism? And maybe, maybe inherently this will be yes, but like, is that version what you see for the future of the GOP, particularly in a state like Oregon? Um, so two part question, let's just start with like, where are you on the conservative spectrum? What kind of a Republican are you? Yeah, I definitely think I'm a little bit more populist than probably some of the mainstream, uh, like even just taking back the issues, one of the things I like the most about Trump compared to the older GOP is like he was actually talking about things like helping working class voters, helping families, like helping bring back jobs. And I think that's just a message the GOP, frankly, had totally surrendered to the left in general. Uh, and that's why I think that you're seeing like some of these working class Hispanic groups like and working class white voters like shift from the Democratic Party closer to the GOP. Now, framing it in the, and that, that's kind of just, I would say that's like a pretty high level view, framing mm -hmm. it with the Oregon GOP in particular, like I think that the party, especially, I don't think on the congressional level, I think maybe it's a little bit different, but like, I think that the party here needs to turn a lot more populist on certain issues if they want to be able to compete in some of the swing districts, right? Like, I just don't see basically how the sort of generic, like, free market, small government strategy, it, it clearly isn't working because our candidates aren't winning. And, uh, and the policies you know, are bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think the policies are bad. I think the policies in some circumstances would be good. But like, again, that clearly just isn't resonating with Oregonians. And I think that if we tried some basically like we clearly need some not to steal from Catholic girl, political innovation, because like the same sort of strategies, I don't think are working. Uh, my, the, my, my original question was for Reagan, to be fair. So I, I want to hear Reagan. Oh, I thought you were asking me. <laughs> it was actually, was, it was helpful. It was helpful. I, I was managing the child. Um, so I, I don't know the pre prescription drug issue well enough to really weigh in on it competently. What I will say is, is like, I would say most polling tells you that in terms of a state legislative candidate, it's like jobs, education, and healthcare. And so that has nothing basically to do with limited government. And, you know, you can still do small taxes uh, as an issue to, to some voters, but like, I would say they're much more concerned about having a job and making sure that their kids are going to good schools and that they can provide health care. Like, that's what most voters care about, but not most voters in the Republican primary, by the way. And that is a part of the issue is this like you have I, I kind of I'm not like a strong advocate for open primaries. Um, I think that might help a little bit, mostly because. I think most people are afraid that if you have an open primary, Republicans are all just going to switch parties and vote for, uh, you know, extremely moderate slash right wing Democrats. That will never happen. So I think open primaries would help because you add basically the people who are conservative voters but have left the party for various reasons, whether it's national messaging or just being fed up with politics in general. Adding their voices back in would help uh, in the primaries. But I mean, ultimately, I think you have, you know, re Republicans running on, you know, conservative top issues, most of them being social Democrats running on liberal social issues. And then in the middle, they try to pivot and uh, they give you whiplash and they pivot to like jobs, education, healthcare. Yeah, and, well, yeah, um, and Reagan and I were actually just messaging this morning because uh, Ben, when I had written that thing about healthcare rationing for the liftoff, I was like, this is crazy. We don't have enough services basically for people who are dying in the hospital to have beds. And you think if you were the party 
who is in the complete opposition, who doesn't control anything. Uh, that's something I imagine would resonate with everybody that like, yeah, we should have a healthcare system where people who need care can have access to it. Well, but so, like so hospital but beds and this, things like that. This is the problem for the GOP is like, that's antithetical to what has been the core of the party, which is spend less money, lower tax. Like that would work to expand rural hospital capacity, which is what Bud Pierce is talking about. I don't buy, I talked to some, after that episode, I talked to one of my friends who works in the healthcare industry. It would be incredibly expensive to expand capacity at all these rural hospitals, like incredibly expensive. How are you going to pay for that? And I, I mean, maybe and we're who's going to staff it? Exa- yeah, where are the we don't have enough people as it is to staff hospitals. So where are we going to find all these new nurses and doctors who are going to go move from where they probably currently live in a city or suburban environment to the Oregon coast or to, like it's a longer term, more com- complex problem that like, I mean, I'm not saying that the Democrats have solved for this, but I certainly don't think the GOP has offered a realistic solution. Well, no, so, like, I, 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 I agree with that. But I'm Oregon saying healthcare policy has been for like since before John Kitzhaber was elected the first time, it's basically been perfect maximization. We only have enough hospital beds and ensure we have enough hospital beds to meet capacity. And that is it. They don't want any like that's the biggest issue with COVID is it wasn't that there was a bunch of beds that were necessarily unstaffed. I mean, you had a little bit of that with the issue. It's like, we didn't want to build any excess capacity because that creates expenses. And so one of the ways that they cut costs in healthcare was not having excess capacity because when you have the capacity, you have to clean it and you have to make sure you have staff available for it and all that stuff. So like that was part of like the policy making that my understanding is both parties basically agreed to. And so this is a great way to cut healthcare costs, unless you're in a pandemic, in which case it screws you. And I think the other part of it is it's like, I don't think any particular state really is necessarily solved for healthcare. It's everybody experimenting. And so like Oregon's experiments have all gone fairly poorly and you've got like cover Oregon, which was a problem. And you've got, you know, you have some other additional, um, uh, additional experiments that have been lower key after cover Oregon. Like after all this headlines, everyone's like, let's not do that again. Well, wasn't the cover, so, the cover Oregon debacle? I mean, there was definitely a debacle there, but um I thought I thought that there was a consensus that in some, like the original Oregon health plan was like a national model that you know folks tried to build off of I thought like we, I think we've had some some wins and losses yeah we've had I think we've had some of both but like I think cover Oregon really made everyone super gun shy I think that's part of it too is like less experimentation happened after that um and I don't know where I was going with that after well, that we, but I think Healthcare is so complicated. That's the biggest issue. Not that many people actually understand. I don't even understand it. We, um, we, there's another whole section that we wanted to tackle, so we should probably jump into that now. It um, sounds good. And, and it's a, and it's kind of about what we've been talking about. But um, redistricting aside, the maps aside, like uh, since I guess you could say 2006, probably the GOP in Oregon has um, been sputtering or declining, at least in legislative seats. I think there hasn't been a Republican governor since uh, Vicatia in he last won election in like 80s, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so 84, maybe. Okay. So do you have, do you have any optimism that Republicans can win a governor's race, for example, in 2022. Um, and if not, what do you believe has to happen to the state at the state Republican Party level? Acknowledging you can't affect what's happening at national level. Um, yeah. So can can Republicans win in 22? And if not, what needs to happen for your party? So I I'm not going to make a definitive statement because I'll say something like Republicans can't win statewide ever, and then we'll have a red wave next year. Um, so I don't want <laughs> to do say that. It, as much as as much as that would work, I think that'd be great. I am skeptical about Republicans winning statewide for the number one reason that it seems to count on Portland will ro- vote correctly this time, which has almost never happened uh, for Republicans in, anyway. Um, they did it in 2016 with Dennis Richardson. And you had a lot of confluence of events. Dennis had just run a statewide campaign. So like the number one problem for Republicans is statewide name ID for candidates. You can compensate for that some with money, but a new candidate busting on the scene has no reputation. Richardson spent over a decade in the legislature building a conservative reputation. So Republicans weren't concerned when he wasn't talking about their issues. They knew where he stood. Uh, He faced a weak Democratic opponent in a year that was 
mildly favorable for Republicans, although not super favorable for Republicans. So, I mean, he did, he, and he did it, ran a great campaign. He did an awesome job. It was 2016, right? Yeah, 2016. So Hillary, so, Hillary got Hillary got only 50% of the vote in 2016. Yeah, and I, I remember Trump doing surprisingly Hillary. well, and then he bottomed out in 2020. And so without him on the ballot in 22, that will help. But then I don't know that the national tie is necessarily working for uh, us. It might, um, but I don't know that yet. It's working. It seems to be working for Republicans in other states, but it seems like the blue wave kind of dies on the East Coast. So we'll see if it's strong enough this time. And I think part of it is like, you got to get rank and file voters on the Republican side engaged and enthused. And I'm not convinced they're enthused yet because they are so used to losing. They've adopted the mentality of, of losing. I think the other thing is in the legislature, I think we have a lot of opportunities. The The new map gives us like, for instance, Brad Witt uh, was redistricted basically out of his seat. They redistricted him into Weber's seat. Um, uh, I don't know exactly why that happened, but I could take a guess at it. Um, and the seat that he was in got red, the, the House of 31. So there'll be a Republican, I think, that could have a great shot at winning that one. Um, there's a couple of other swing seats. Um, there's a lot to compete for, although Dems monkeyed around a lot with the Salem area. And then I think we have a chance at a couple of Senate seats. So on the legislature, I think we can build, we can break out of the super majority, uh, a super minority and at, build a better case for voters. But as long as our top line issues aren't focused on the issues that the majority of voters care about, I don't know that we will make the progress necessary to win a statewide election. Hmm. And I, I don't know exactly what needs to happen for us to win a statewide election, because it's kind of one of those things where it's like, it'll happen when we don't see it coming. Um, but I think it is going to take uh, a really strong candidate. And I, uh, I'm hoping that some of the candidates in the current crop prove that they're that strong, but we don't know that yet. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a, it's really a wait and see game. Hmm. Titus, I'm you... not convinced we'll win statewide in 2022, but you know, if, if things start going better and better for us over the next six months, I could be convinced. Titus, do you, do you align with that um, description or is there anything you would add? Yeah, I think that that sounds right. Uh, I, and I've said this repeatedly. I think it's probably going to take, and I, I just don't even know if you ever get a cycle like this. It's going to take three, four cycles of great candidates running their hearts out, probably continuing to lose, and then maybe something will actually happen, but I am. Uh, so I've advocated the... for to anyone. I apologize for interrupting you, Alex, but I didn't want to forget this. I've advocated to everybody that Republicans should just look at the Stacey Abrams model in Georgia and adopt it in reverse. And basically <laughs> what they did was yeah. they got really good at losing and then they won. And that's what you have to do. You have to run your best candidates and you have to do all your fundraising and you have to knock all the doors. You have to get all the groups engaged and you have to do all of that and know you're going to lose. Hmm. And you just have to do it as really well. And through that, you'll build a database, you'll build a set of voters, you'll get people more voting, accustomed to voting for Republicans again. And because uh, I think what happened was, is people voted Republican, and then they started to regret it in Oregon, and we haven't given them a reason to not regret it. Um, and so if we can start giving them those reasons by running really solid candidates that lose, they'll eventually enough of them will decide to vote for us. And so it's about engaging all the groups you have available. And a lot of times you have a lot of infighting on the Republican party. And so that's been difficult. And then it's about engaging disaffected voters, which I think we struggle to do because we don't know what their problems are. And, and then I think it's about running the best candidates knowing they're gonna lose. And most people aren't willing to make that sacrifice because it's an extremely hard sacrifice to make. Because a lot of times what happened too, I mean, Stacey Abrams was one of the candidates who, who ran and was a really good candidate and lost. And so she had to be willing to sacrifice the fact that she wasn't going to win those elections. She, you have to basically say, I'm going to run. I'm not going to be the person that gets elected. It's going to be the person behind me. But what most of the candidates want to do is they want to run, lose, and then run again and try to win. And if, if you don't have the model properly, you know, if you don't have everything set and everything going and then hit that perfect cycle, it's not going to be there. And so, like, we have to have candidates and people who are more selfless. And I don't think that we've, like, reached that, that part yet. I wouldn't want to run and lose like it sucks. So like, I understand it, but it's, it's something we have to get past. That's a brilliant, brilliant comparison. Um, and I think it will be fast. There's a lot of speculation that Stacey Abrams may run for governor again. Um, and it will be interesting mm -hmm. to see how that plays. She would be the most popular democratic candidate for governor, probably in the country. Um, so oh, she'd easily win the primary. Yeah. The fundraising <laughs> would be there. Um, yep. but then to, I mean, 
I, I do think, at least nationally, it's hard to know locally whether this is true, but nationally, I think there's a there's a pretty widespread understanding that Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff are senators because of Stacey Abrams, or at least that's the, yes, that's the narrative. Yes, absolutely. I totally. believe that. Yeah. yeah. Because they're, they're kind of like, you kind of look at them and you're like, how? Like <laughs> Ossoff, Ossoff is, is a young guy. He didn't have a wife when he was running. He was basically a bachelor and he was running in Georgia. And I'm not even sure that he had been from Georgia most of that time. Like he had been gone away at school. Like, and he didn't have a lot on his resume from what I understand, but he like ran in the right year, ran a good campaign and he won. Like that's this, I think that's the secret is it's like almost like if you were just compared to people and you didn't put the partisanship next to them, voters almost never choose the best candidate or not always. They don't always choose the best candidate, but they choose the candidate, you know, that they like the most. And so if you have like a really strong likability factor also you know what really hurts you in elections is if your own party is saying those elections are rigged and that you <laughs> that your vote doesn't matter that really hurts you in elections like i think that that's the number one reason the senate's 50 50 like warnock uh would have won but ossoff should have lost purdue would have won uh number one if you didn't have a runoff but number two if in the runoff republicans in the north part of georgia didn't stay home because donald trump told them to like that sucks that's a problem like, I don't care who it is. If you say the elections are, are rigged and you don't present evidence for it and that evidence gets shot down in court repeatedly, the elections weren't rigged, you lost them and you have to just try to win them. And like, I think a lot of people, that's one of the other things we're combating on the Republican side. Like at, at a lot of these local meetings, the thing they want to talk about is rigged elections. Guess what? If the elections were rigged, you know who would have said so? Dennis Richardson. He was secretary of state for almost four years and he was a Republican and he was looking for fraud. Wait, so you didn't find it. In Oregon- the, the GOP base wants to talk about rigged elections. It is a it is a hot topic. It is, Interesting. And, and I don't think it's the majority of the base, but it's the majority of the base that shows up to Republican meetings and stuff like that. And like I've talked to legislators and a lot of them are like, when I go back to my uh, district, I try to talk about the issues that are most pressing, try to talk about redistricting and, and rigged maps. And they want to talk about rigged elections. And like, that's a problem. And that's a national problem that was given to us in Oregon. And I know that there's like, like there's, there's been journalists. Almost as if there's exposés. a podcast with that theme. Right, exactly. <laughs> that would be a great podcast. We should talk about starting one of those. But like the theme at these meetings is red elections. And you have Republican legislators saying basically like, I haven't seen the evidence. And it's mostly people online saying, well, Biden's numbers went up in Oregon and we had had a history of Democrats doing worse in my area. And it's like, like there's, there's somebody who said Lynn County elections are rigged. And it's like, no, it's massive population growth, high turnout. Like it's, it doesn't make sense. And they've lost in court everywhere. They've presented these arguments. And Dennis Richardson would have said something if the elections were rigged. Like it's not a conspiracy. We've checked. And the other thing too, is, is that I think that there are probably more problems with vote by mail in other states because they don't have as much history. But remember that vote by mail was implemented in the 80s and, and was adjusted in the 90s. It might have been the 70s. These are the 80s. Uh, I don't remember how long we've had vote by mail. My entire life we have. But like there were Republicans in power in the legislature during that time. It wasn't a wholesale like mail everyone a ballot. They don't have to do anything but fill it out and return it. Like we have checks in place for signatures. We have a ton of protections that other states haven't implemented all of. And so I think in some ways it's like Democrats are like, let's implement Oregon's vote by mail everywhere. And I'm like, yes, because most states don't have these protections vote by mail and they wouldn't want them if they asked for it. And because I don't think that Democrats nationally want all of those, all of those checks and balances. And so I like, I like Oregon's system. Like, uh, you know, would I love to go to the polls someday and vote? That would be fun. I pretended to one year when I walked into the elections office with my ballot, stood in the little box thing that they had and pretended that I was voting for like the rest of the country does. But I think it still works. And I don't think that it's fraught with fraud. You know, I think that banning ballot harvesting would be awesome. You saw kind of one of the union groups turn in 94 ballots like like that's really bad. And but you know, 94 Richard, ballots, as we all know, is not. No, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have affected the outcome of any major election that I'm aware of. Right. And if, and if it did, someone would file a lawsuit. Like, that's the other thing. This is like, if you have evidence of a rigged election, bring it to court. But Republicans in Oregon don't do that because we know the elections aren't rigged. Like, we look at the numbers and we go, oh, yeah, maybe we ran a really lousy campaign here. Or maybe the, the candidate was embroiled in scandal or maybe it was a D plus 15 district. And we kind of it's just like it's not easy to win. You know, so I think that that's important is we can't we can't we can't keep 
in, in talking about elections like they're rigged. I think election integrity is important. I think everyone cares about election integrity because if you have fake elections, we're just electing, you know, Vladimir Putin with 97% of the vote. Nobody wants that, but we're clearly not doing that right now. And most, there's so many people analyzing elections, both at the national and local level. Like if there were alarming patterns that you could detect with math, which is possible, it would happen. Yeah. And so it's not happening. We need to, you know, we need, it's really hurt. It really hurts us when Donald Trump goes out or any of his surrogates go out and say stuff like that. And that's why you see Republicans at the national level talking about election integrity. They're not saying, most of them aren't saying elections are rigged. They're saying we need to protect our elections, but it's because their base keeps coming to them and saying, I heard this was a huge issue. Donald Trump said it was a huge issue. What are you doing to fix it? And they're trying to pivot off of that and try to address the concern and move on to something that would actually work. So So fascinating. That is so fascinating to hear on so many different levels. Um, I was shocked by it too, honestly, because I I haven't attended those meetings in a while. It's not easy to do with young kids. You know, it's, it's part of the, I think that's the other thing too, the political process. And I know everybody says this, but it's like, we need young people. The biggest issue with that though, is, is everybody says they want young people involved in the the political process, but then they don't because (laughs) young people bring different ideas and different opinions and we should do something different. And if you've been done, if you've done something that's resulted in you winning elections for the past 30 years, you know, you don't want that. You want to carefully, like you see, so I see Democrats on Twitter a lot, leftist Democrats criticizing Democrats in the legislature for being too moderate on stuff. Right. Yeah. The reason that happens is because they've won elections for 30 years at the at 40 years at the statewide level and they've had the legislature for i think over 10 years now basically and they're like we're not going to screw with that by passing big massive legislation that could come back to bite us in the butt and so they do things like over chunks over a, a period of time it's like it's one of the things i respect about the speaker kotek the most it's like sure is she a liar and doesn't keep her word yeah but she's really good at managing the the political uh, fall out of these things and making sure they're not taking too big of a chunk out of each issue. And Republicans talk about it in the legislature and they're like, yeah, they're slowly advancing this issue. And what happens is I was talking to a state legislator the other night at the Reagan dinner and they're like, yeah, the worst thing about Democrats is we negotiate on an issue from a starting position. And so then they pass their bill that's like half of what they wanted. And then they come back the next year and say, well, your position is what we passed this last time. It's like, no, we're still over here. You're pretending like this is our new starting position. This is what you passed. And now you're negotiating off of it, right? But they're taking the small chunks in, in change in policy because they don't want to change things radically. And I think a lot of the young people want to change things radically, you know? And, and when you do that, you know, so I, I go to Republican meetings and they're like, it's so good to see a young person involved. And then I stand up and say, oh, uh, well, we should actually do something this way instead of this way. And they go, well, you're such an idiot. And it's like, that's why <laughs> young people don't want to be involved in politics because you say you want us, then we give our opinions and you say we're done. Okay, so and I, I like, <laughs> that's such a challenge. I can't let the Speaker Kotek jab slide without at least asking. I know, you're you're running for the legislature. You gotta <laughs> go for it. No, but, go but, for it. But, but, but truly, so the Speaker aside, because yeah. what, what the Speaker and Representative Salinas and others say is like, um, and this is like getting back to our first question about redistricting. How did we get here? Yeah. They basically say Republicans wouldn't substantively engage with us until the first maps came out. And because of this whole census issue, our timeline was like three weeks that we had to do this. Do you think that that Republicans played this the right way? Or do you think that there were some self-inflicted wounds that contributed to like a poor, poor, you know, what's funny, I, I've been joking to people. Most people seem to be okay with most of the maps. But the process is what people are just like melting down about. So, so you- my understanding of the process and this and and it could just be that we're getting different stories and the, and the stories are never going to completely match because I think that you have sort of that problem, right, where the perspective from the Democrats is, well, we're in the majority and we're the ones that are tasked with doing redistricting and the legislature is supposed to accomplish redistricting. And if Republicans stand in the way of Republic of accomplishing redistricting, then they're not holding up their end of the bargain. And this is the other thing. I don't know what the exact deal was that was made in the legislature. My understanding of the deal was Republicans get split three, three. And the way I would understand that is no matter what happens, three, three is a split in, in the, in the committee. Maybe that's not the understanding the Democrats had. I don't know. I think so. If their view of the deal was as long as the outcome is legislative maps, you can have a three-three split. Then yeah, obviously we're going to have a problem because I don't think that's how Republicans interpreted the deal. I think the other half of it is basically that Republicans 
my understanding is that Republicans were required to negotiate based on a starting position of, of Democratic maps, right? And so like- I thought it was status quo maps, which maybe you call those Democratic Maybe status quo maps, but I would say Republicans believe those to be Democratic advantage maps, right? They obviously elect a, a, a strong Democratic majority and in some cases the supermajority, right? So if you're required to negotiate based on status quo maps and you believe those are gerrymandered maps, you don't really wanna start from those maps. And the thing that can't happen because of the way the process works is like, if so, and I think that the other thing is like, there's outside forces involved, right? It's not just legislators that have an interest in maps. It's the single issue groups and individual voters and funders of these maps, right? And so it's like, you know, you want to believe that none of the, that it's only the legislators deciding that, but I'm not sure that anybody believes that even if you told them and show them all the evidence of that, right? And so if you draw, if you put three Republicans and three Democrats in a room and you say, okay, we're going to draw maps and the, and, and you start from zero and then you draw those maps as soon as you, and, and then you have that deal. As soon as you exit the room, both sides of your parties are there to point out everything that is wrong with what the deal that you just made. So, and this happens all the time when Republicans and Democrats cut deals, they get criticized, right? And it's mm -hmm. because, you know, didn't get enough of this or gave too much away at that, right? So you, you draw those maps, right? And then you exit. And, and if you make too many mistakes in that drawing and don't account for all of the things that everybody cares about, you're, they're going to target your maps and try to defeat them or, or force changes or whatever it is, right? And it's safer to start with, for Democrats, it's safer to start with status quo maps because we've been running and winning under these maps. For Republicans, you don't really want to do that because we've been running and losing under these maps, right? But the, and Republicans, so you'd rather, did, the Republicans voted for those maps 10 years ago. They did vote for those maps 10 years ago. So that's the, I mean, I, that's, that's where I think we begin to go other way, like, Democrats right. position is like, we agreed on these 10 years ago, you said they were fair. And now Republicans like, but we lost in those. So they can't be fair. <laughs> it's like, well. right. And well, and I think it's part of the problem is, is a, we just haven't won enough elections. But the other part of it is too, is I think that like our understanding of, of how those maps were drawn and, and how fair and how many competitive, like, like, I think we just actually just got like beat in the process and we were pissed about it because in, in the process, I think mm. our ability to understand how voters, you know, how voters were districted in those maps and the technology that we had available, I think was just less than what Democrats had available. That's and so like literally it's just, it's, it's kind of our, our fault. Like, you know, if we had spent more, if we had had more resources available, like we were, we, we had just won a majority. We picked up it was either six or eight seats in the in the 10 election. And so we were just like scrambling. We, you know, we hadn't, we hadn't run the legislature recently, but we hadn't ever completed a redistricting under the red Republican legislature. Like that's the other problem. We tried to pass mm -hmm. maps. We tried to pass them actually through a, a, this is interesting. So the reason Democrats walked out in 2001 on redistricting maps is because Republicans, um, there isn't anything in the law that says how you have to pass the maps. And it had been an understanding for a while that the, the governor signs the maps. The governor isn't elected under those maps. He's elected under the whole state. In 2001, Republicans said, okay, we'll pass the maps as a joint resolution. That doesn't require uh, the signature Which doesn't of the require the signature of the governor. Oh. And Democrats went, oh, snap, and had to leave. And, and they would <laughs> not the come governor, back until that changed, right? The governor would have vetoed the maps. The governor would have vetoed Republican maps, but they couldn't veto a resolution. And I think he would have ended up in court over <laughs> that's that. That's brilliant. Wow. But it was a brilliant legislative move by the Republicans at the time. And that's why, Dem, I mean, Dems had to walk, right? Because that's your only option, right? And so I think that if you come to the same scenario and say Republicans are like, shoot, We've got the, a Democratic governor that will sign any map that is presented by the legislature pretty much. And the secretary of state that's ready to kick us in the pants even more. You know, maybe we just walk out and hope we get better congressional maps and Democrats hate it. And therefore, you know, we've at least won, won something. And so you can kind of see where each party gets to that point of desperation and decides to do the desperate thing. And and they can't know the future consequences of those actions. Did Democrats walk out thinking Republicans are going to be walking out on them? No. I'm not even sure they knew that they would be in the majority in the near future, right? Um, and dealing with democratic walkouts. So it's it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, you should, and I think the other thing about the maps too, is it's like, you know, the process broke down somewhere because you even had some Democrats saying that like, we didn't like the process, it, it didn't work. And, you know, maybe there's fault on the Republican side. I don't know enough about the, exactly what happened to know for sure. But we know that there's faults on the Democratic side because the agreement didn't make it all the way through 
through the session. And and I think that most Republicans would say she didn't honor the agreement because it was supposed to be a 3-3 split committee for all the maps, not just the legislative maps. And, and you know, and there's the issue uh, of, you know, is, is it the Republicans' job as a caucus to hold together? Is it individual members' job to vote for whatever whatever map they prefer, right? right. And right now, the yeah. main consensus is you should vote with your caucus. Like, so when Republicans pull bills to the floor, they're almost always unanimous Democratic votes against, regardless of the issue, unless they think that issue is going to be brought up in the election. And like, that's the only reason you pull bills to the floor is for an election, uh, and and to make the you know the Democrats look bad by voting against it. But they like they talk about and make decisions about who should be released and allowed to vote for these in order to ensure one they have 31 votes to defeat the motion they almost i think only one time has ever happened as a minority report or a bill poll ever been adopted to the floor right it doesn't happen because that's circumventing the process of the speaker deciding where the bills go and the chairs and the committees deciding which bills come to the floor um but you still have the like political calculus decisions that you have to make about which Democrats in vulnerable seats get to vote for this so they don't get nailed on it in mailers, right? Um, or in political material. So hmm. yeah, I don't know well, if that's Reg- helpful, but my my whole goal, I built a candidate tracker on my website, reagancanope.net. And my whole goal was basically just like expose more of the process to more you're, people. You're supposed to wait for me to ask you about this. Oh, I'm plot. sorry. <laughs> Come on. I am. I'm just a jerk and a massive self-promotionalist. I, I was going to, and yeah, Reagan, unfortunately we're, we're right up at time. Cause I know Ben has to head out in a second. So before we let no you problem. go, uh, one, thank you for coming on. And then mm-hmm. two, this is self plug time. So self plug away. Yeah. Where can absolutely. People find so- you? Mo, you can find me in Oregon Catalyst. I'm the editor there. I've started writing a bunch uh, more there since I went to be at home uh, with my kids. And editing um, some fantastic submissions recently. Right? Yeah, I had some some really good uh, submissions that are, you know, bylined by people with short names. You can check them out if you want. <laughs> um, and then, so I do Oregon Catalyst. Uh, I write my own newsletter and and some stuff on, you can find on ringcanope.net. And that's where I put my candidate tracker. And I just, because... You can't file for legislature yet, and a lot of people announce stuff but don't file the paperwork right away. I just try to grab all the news articles um, or post rumors that I have that that um, about people who might run for certain offices, and and some of it's based on you know flimsy ish rumors sometimes. But I do my best to try to vet them as best I can about um, legitimacy. And sometimes the other thing that people forget is it's like some people just like running for office isn't just like always a political decision, and it impacts family and work and stuff like that. Some people just change their minds. Like they say, I'm going to run for this. And then they're like, actually, that's going to be a problem. I'm not going to do that. So anyway, yeah. I try to post the uh, stuff there. And then you can find me on Twitter at Reagan Canope. Um, I tweet about politics a lot there and, and engage with people and, um, you know, own the libs, that sort of thing. His <laughs> own Ben many times. You'll have to, you'll have to he wouldn't some dare come powers. after me on Twitter. <laughs> he wouldn't dare. You know, I will say this. I probably wouldn't vote for Ben if I lived in House District 25, but he's not the worst Democrat. So if you want to pull that and, and use you it for- You just tanked an all of my favorabilities on, on the left. So thank you for that, Reagan. No, Great. Well, Reagan, welcome. thanks thanks again so much for joining the show. Uh, and everybody, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to give us five stars if your platform allows you to do that and hit the subscribe button. And please write us a review and leave your comments in the review. We love to read uh, the reviews. And also- Definitely check this one out on YouTube because there is a lot of baby action, (laughs) very cute baby action. So uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, watch the videos. We're going to be doing a lot more there. So uh, thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode. See you, everyone.